the one. This is Brad Thor, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Hey, Brad, this is fun. I love to uh, I love to talk to authors that work in your genre. I'm going to have uh, Andrews and Wilson on next week talking about their latest book. Talk to just gosh, so many of you guys, and you just you always have such powerful minds, and you're just fascinating. <laughs> have you have you been interviewed by a spy before? I, I used to be a counterintelligence agent back in the day. Uh, you know what I have, cause I've done some kind of intelligence community podcasts. So, so yeah, I've dealt with some people from, from the IC nice. before. So it's always fun. Yeah. 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 What, when you build a character, like, okay, look, you've got, you've got your latest book is coming out. Here's the link for that. Everybody go right down below it. It's rising tiger. And it's the, what the 21st uh, installment in that series. That's incredible. But there's the end yeah. over there. Yeah. So when you try to build characters and, and evolve characters, how do you how do you keep them realistic? How do you how do you like, keep guys like me satisfied? I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's not too much. Because like Jason Bourne is so like impossible, right? Because he's so good at everything. <laughs> well, it depends. If you're reading the Bourne books, there was actually a lot of turmoil in the Jason Bourne character. The books, uh, you know, the books can always uh, they do so much more than movies ever can do. So yeah, the 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 Matt Damon movie where they sped up the the uh, <laughs> the hand to hand stuff to make it look even more wicked. Uh, it's good for what it is. I mean, I've enjoyed the the Bourne movies, but the books were were excellent. Actually, that was Ludlum, and I really enjoyed those books, particularly his inner turmoil. Uh, for me, I base a lot of these characters on people I know, and uh, so I've always said that I buy a lot of pitchers of beer and pay for a lot of steak dinners. And so it allows me to be around different types of men and women, particularly in the special operations or in the intelligence community, and just listen. I think that's the key. To, there's two things you got to do to be a, you know, three things, actually, to be a great writer. You got to be a great reader. If you're not a great reader, you can't even be a halfway decent writer. Uh, you've got to be an excellent listener, and you also have to be a terrific uh, observer of people. So... Uh, you know, it's funny because I'll if I can't get to a location in one of my books, I want to talk to somebody who not has just gone to that location, but has operated there. Somebody who notices small details and that kind of stuff adds to the color in the book. But as far as the characters are concerned, a lot of them, almost all of them are based on people I know. And then do you. I mean, I know you know your audience and they're willing to go on leaps with you and you don't have to be as realistic as, as you know, maybe like someone like me would expect because your job is to put us on a roller coaster as read that book, right? And, yeah. and the demands of the story are different than the actual demands of life. No, no one wants to read about how I'm always hungry and I go to midnight chow. And then maybe that little burst of energy that gets into my head gives me inspiration. I, that, like I, I got my ass chewed by a guy from the CIA, a uh, retired guy from the agency. It yeah. was like, oh, you know, there'd be seven cutouts or there, he'd have to go through seven people before he got that piece of information. And I said, yeah. listen, if I'm writing a tra training manual for people at the farm, sure, yeah. there'd be seven, right. you know, there'd be seven uh, meetings that had to happen before you'd be put together with this one source. I said, but I'm not. So I cut it down mm. to two or I cut it to three. And I said, that's that's why I do what I do and you do what you do. I said, yeah. it's completely different. It's not apples to apples. Uh, it, it, just to accentuate <laughs> that point, I get inserted into fill in the blank district in Afghanistan or Iraq. Right. And I don't know who I need to talk to. I, just, I have to go out and talk to people and I don't have hundred percent control over where I go because the area is non-permissible. No one wants to read about how I went out today and talked to some lady and her cow, you know, because well, you don't know who that person's going to be. Like, oh, and in chapter two, Pete talked to a lady with the cow. You know, tune in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a hell of a cliffhanger. What's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that is the that is the trick. Elmore Leonard was famous for for saying to writers, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I can give you. He said, I'll give you two pieces of great advice. Number one, never start with the weather. It was a dark mm. and stormy night. Right. And number two, leave out the uh, parts that people skip. Uh, I really enjoy Clancy, but my dad is very funny. My dad used to say he swore Clancy got paid by the word because there were so <laughs> many <laughs> unnecessary words in those books and they were like this thick. So that's that's really the art. I mean, this is, you know, you do get a lot of ex-military, ex-intelligence guys that want to come in and write fiction and they have great backgrounds. Uh, they, they obviously know of what they speak, 
but that's not enough just to know how operations work and things like that are, are not necessarily a guarantee that you're going to write a gripping piece of fiction. And, and that's where it, it does drift into being an art form, how you hold yeah. people's attention, how you keep them turning those pages. How long should a chapter be? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, right. And, and Clancy is a, a great example of a short, at least initially short chapters when you're like, he talks about there being a log in the ocean. There's a log in the ocean. And then he brings that log back in and the submarine that, you know, whatever. Right. And so you're, you're constantly page turning with him. But, but I will say this, and look, we're basically the same exact age, right? Like we're not even a year apart. When you reach a point in Tom Clancy's career where whoever was writing his stuff, him, or somebody else, uh, his voice aged out of my interest band and his oh, characters were, were um, of a different time, but he was representing them as if they were my time. <laughs> you know, I do remember when he did started the campus stuff. And I don't know if that was Jack Ryan Jr. or what there was there, but it was two young guys in their 20s that were talking about Ernest and Julio Gallo. And I said, there are, that's like an old, and there are going to be people that are watching this and listening to this that have no idea who Ernest and Julio Gallo were. But they were these California winemakers that used to have commercials on TV. I remember them as a kid. Yeah. these commercials being on but like these guys in this clancy novel yeah i agree would not have been talking about these two in that commercial so that that is something that you have to be how do you stay relevant how do you right right and how do you keep the books ever green that's also kind of a tightrope uh that you have to walk because i'm very proud of the fact that i've put out 21 books with Scott Harvath, 22 books all together. Uh, and I tell people my books are like the James Bond movies. You don't need to have ever seen a Bond movie to go right. to your local theater and see the latest one. Uh, it's, if you want to start at the beginning with Lions of Lucerne, you can. You can start with the newest one, Rising Tiger. I always do this wrong because my screen is flipped around. So there it is right back there. <laughs> uh, but... It, my books are evergreen. You can still pick up my very first novel and have a great white knuckle edge of your seat thrill ride because I didn't weave in too much current events, pop culture. I want people to be able to pick up the books at any point and enjoy them, which is one of the reasons I never wrote about bin Laden. I knew eventually we were going to catch him or kill him, and that was going to spoil a book because you'd know how it ended if it was all about getting bin Laden. One of the things, uh, one of my critiques when I do read books, and a lot of these guys are my friends, so I'm not being critical of my friends, just, you know, as as someone who's done work overseas, we often, um, the Intel guy gets turned into one or two things, an impossible badass or the bookish Ivy League guy. And uh, I'm either of those things. Like, look, I'm a bit of a badass and everything, but but I'm not, you know, if I'm on a SEAL team supporting those guys, they're all better ass than I am, you know, sure, for sure. sure. So we... You know, there's all kinds of different people that do this active intel work, and we're all we're all different cats. A lot of us do box or athletic. A lot of us read a lot of books. A lot of us do both. How do you how do you sort through like not becoming tropey? Because it's easy to become tropey and and not not hit the mark. I think that's a good it's a good question. Again, I, you know, I know some super super interesting guys. I mean, I know a guy who. You know, his skin will start to itch if he's more than five minutes behind the wire. Like he loves <laughs> being out in Indian country, right? And he's yeah. really good with all the hearts and mind stuff. Uh, he did really well in Afghanistan with the relationships he built and and the places he could go into where they would take him in, where all the, uh, you know, the local Shura knew him and all this kind of stuff and really liked him. And he was a, he was a doer. He, he <laughs> I'll tell you one of the funniest things I said, all right. He's like, I said, this particular Shura, how did you get in so tight with these guys? He said, I brought my Pez dispenser. I'm like, what do you mean you brought your Pez dispenser? He goes, Brad, I got to tell you, you think we're, in the beginning, he said, you know, I, I got another buddy of mine that set up a, a, a safe house with the agency in Herat, and they were walking around with ammo cans full of uh, currency, buying back stingers, okay, because they wanted to get those out of there as quickly as possible. Great story. And uh, I, the guy bought more rugs from the local rug guys to keep, you know, the, the local economy going and stuff. But my other buddy who talked about the Pez dispenser, I'm like, what do you mean Pez dispenser? He goes, he goes, I have, because I joke that it's my Pez dispenser. He goes, but I've got this huge bottle of Viagra. And he said, all these guys have multiple wives and a lot of them have younger wives. And he said, you would not believe how far I get handing out Viagra to these dudes. And I'm like, you know, if I had come up with that idea, I would have been like 
I would have thought that was too much if I had invented that to put it in a book because nobody would believe it. So there's a, you've seen this, Pete. There's characters out there. There's some really, really interesting people that work in that field. And there is something special about people who can um, build a human network, right? So they're, yeah. they're great people uh, persons. And it's, it, it takes a real special skill to be able to connect with people from different cultures as well. Uh, in fact, I've got a buddy of mine that talks about trying to train up the new crop of guys that are that are coming up and he's trying to pass down some of his wisdom. And so he'll do stuff with guys on his uh, on his team and he'll say, OK, well, let's let's take, for example, you're chatting some chick in a bar. Ah, like, oh, we don't chat up chicks in the bar. He said, what do you how do you get how do you, pardon my French? But he said, how do you get laid? And they start going like this. They're uh -huh. all on Tinder and all this kind of stuff. So guys yeah. who didn't grow up with like the hookup apps and all that kind of stuff that actually had to walk up to a woman in a bar and strike up a conversation. Uh, what we're seeing is, and we're getting so deep into kind of the psychology stuff here and everything, but it, it's interesting how much we had in our generation experience wise and having to go up and speak as, as men who are looking to date women, go up and start chatting them up and talk to them and build rapport. Right. So it isn't just yeah. about, can you get this woman into bed? It's, can you build rapport? You know, this may, this, you may end up marrying this woman, but you won't yeah. know until you talk to her. So it, it, that is probably one of the most fascinating things I look at when I talk to people who mm -hmm. are doing, uh, you know, who are intelligence officers and who are doing things downrange. It's just fascinating the different personalities, but they're all people uh, persons. You, you 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 can't you can't be successful without having those people skills. No, this is a hundred percent true. At least in terms of how I operate, you know, I didn't have a Pez dispenser, but I am looking for the <laughs> smallest problem or the smallest benefit I can provide. And I what come with fix for them. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and not like build a house, you know, mm -hmm. like what's a problem right now we can move today. And a lot of it was like, can we fix this patch of the road? Yes. Instantly yeah. we can do that. You know, can we move this piece of concrete? I went to Bosnia and they were all trying to rebuild their homes and the guy, and I asked him this question. I didn't know, like this was just me like trying to figure out how to be an agent. And uh, I'm like, what's like, what's something you can't get that you should be able to get. And he's like, oh man, sunscreen. If we could just hit some sunscreen, wow. it would be such a, it would, it would be wonderful. Cause they were just getting hammered, right? Cause they got to rebuild their lives. And so I, you know, it's the army. Spot <laughs> box of sunscreen, bam. Yeah. And he's like, all right, listen, you're a good dude. I'm going to introduce you to some people. See? And that, yeah. And I had no idea that was going to happen. I was doing that because I'm a good dude. Yeah. You know, like yeah. what's up tonight? Double A batteries. Shit. I'll be right back. You know, and so, powder, yeah. clean yeah. socks. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> you want, you want, you want some old bay? I can get you some old bay. How's the food around here? Oh you know, yeah, old case old, old bay. bay. Yeah, I've actually just been getting back into old bay because you can't get that out here in California very often. It's like <laughs> smoking the bandit. You know, you got to have a friend of your smuggling. <laughs> I want to go back to the, this very small things though, because these are the things that matter. And one of the things that I realize is that a lot of these elders didn't get the respect that they deserved or had earned from um from americans and so i would find these guys and be like hey you know brad's an important dude i'm like hey brad why don't you come and meet me on my camp i'll feed you for a change instead of us all eating your food yeah. and um and then i would go and i would backwire this thing so i'd go to the uh, the local sergeant at the gate and i'd say i'm gonna bring brad in brad's a very important man he's very influential and you're not gonna search him you're gonna treat him yeah. he's a he's a government official you're gonna treat him as if he's a member of congress coming in and the car start and i'm like and i'm giving you this chance first i'm gonna go all the way to the top and get this all wired but i need you to understand this and here's your chance to be an nco and so we go i go through this whole process and sure enough brad and i would walk up usually hand in hand right through the gate and i take him into the chow hall and now I had put him in our world of air conditioning and ice cream mm -hmm. and yeah. all the food. And I'm like, fill your pockets. Fill your, and look, the, the contract companies hated it, but the boss loved it. He's like, you're plying this guy with muffins. I'm like, yeah, man, muffins yeah. and sandwiches and respect, you know? And boy, I'll tell you what, that opened those guys' hearts up to me because they saw that I cared about them and was trying to, to pay them the proper respect and give them a little break from the norm. And look, you put some, you put ice cream in someone's mouth when they haven't had good ice cream in forever. Yeah. I'll take, I'll take that against, look, I'm not trying to buy stingers. If that was my job, I'd take money because that's a good way to do sure. it. But I'll sure. take that challenge against any other collector and I'll just use ice cream and I'll whoop everybody's ass. 
oh, he'll want to see you again. And he'll want to come back yeah. to the fob with you again. So, I mean, absolutely. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, also, I bring ice cream out to the remote sites. You know, just oh. five five gallons under each arm, you know, and I walk off the helicopter and I go up to the cook. They don't got to know me, but they do know that I brought them ice cream and they don't get it out there. You know, it's <laughs> I, I like Cheech, ice Cheech and Chong. It's the ice cream man. <laughs> <laughs> so so when, when, uh, when we're talking about all of these things and you're in these fantasy worlds, how how well do you know all of your characters? I mean, do you do you grieve when these guys die? How emotionally connected are you? Well, it's, it is a, I'm not as emotionally connected as you might think, because you really have to keep them a certain distance away from you or else they start, the inmates start running the asylum, right? So I got to be, I got to be careful. I know who they are. I know what motivates them. I know what their goal is and what they want. And then, and then in the drama of the novel, they've got to be foiling each other's intentions and stuff like that. So I think the readers feel the pain more than I do. Uh, but it, it, it's per, it, it's purposeful that I keep them further away from me than the readers pull them in close, if that makes sense. I just have to, to run the whole operation. I can't, these are my employees. These are not my friends. They're my employees. This is my rice bowl. So, you know, yeah. I, I can't afford to let them run the show because they'll go off in crazy directions and I'll lose uh, control of everything. But you need some crazy in there. So is that a new character you pin up for a purpose or, or how do you, how do you, how do you control, but create the crazy? So I've heard writing likened to creating order out of chaos. And that's very, very true. I, I don't outline. I'm what's called a pantser. Uh, okay. So I come into the office every day and I don't know what's going to happen. I know this character has got to get across town with this other guy and there's people shooting at him and they got to be there because this is the last train that's going out that leaves at five o'clock and I got to figure out how to get them there. So there's a lot of stress that's inherent in the way I write the books. And, you know, I've written 22 novels now. You would think it gets easier and it doesn't. It gets harder and harder and harder. Uh, my parents raised me. I was raised in the Midwest. My mom was a flight attendant. My dad uh, had gone after the Marine Corps, had gone to school in the GI Bill and got into the uh, into real estate. And I was always taught that you treat every day on the job as, it's your, as if it's your first day. And never forget that if you don't put in your all, it could be your last day. And I, I, people snicker, and it's so true when I say this. I don't work for Simon & Schuster. I, I have a lovely publisher, but I don't work for them. I work for the readers. The readers are my employers, and I want them to be happy. When they go leave those five stars on Amazon, that's my annual performance review. I come out with a book a year, and I want them to be as happy as possible. So I listen to what the readers say. Uh, I don't always incorporate all of it, but I do pay attention to, is there something they like and they want to see more of? Is there something they didn't like and want to see less of? Those comment sections uh, at Goodreads and Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all over the place are just wonderful. Just these pots of gold. If you really care about your craft and your business, people will tell you what they like, what they don't like. And then there's just some people that are just honorary, right? They don't, they, nothing's going to ever make them happy. And you can look and they only do bad reviews about everything. You know, this damn hair dryer, you know, I plugged it in and it was too hot, you know, the, the hot setting was too hot. It's like, well, some people you'll never make happy, but yeah. those really are pots of gold where your readers will tell you what they're liking. So we always joke here at the house. If I could give the zero stars, I would. <laughs> All right. I do that with my, I do that with my kids too. Once they were driving age, I made them uh, designated drivers for me and my wife. And so, you know, I'd be like, all right, this could be a five-star ride. This could be a zero star ride. I'm like, there's no mints in the back seat. And, and it's funny because we were joking with them, but we did like, you know, my son, we could teach him about opening doors for a date and things like that. It was a, uh, we use a lot of humor in my house. It's an excellent teaching tool and it failing the humor, you know, I get out the taser. Uh, I don't even have to, you know, use it anymore. I find just getting out the taser and waving it around gets the kid's attention pretty fast. So that's, it's a good tool too, as a parent. Yeah. I like to, uh, turn phrases. You know, so you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, but is what's good for the gander good for the goose? Oh, you know? that's a good one. Yeah. And also you get to thinking, you're like, actually, and then uh, one of them that I, I, I just irks me when I hear it, all boats rise with the tide. Mm, maybe. Or Whatever. if it's a rising tide lifts all boats. Right, right. Yeah, that was, I said it wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if it's everybody's, yeah. So 
I use that a lot in the positive sense that if things are getting good, it's getting, right. you know, it's, it's helping everybody get good. Uh, what I love, my brother is hysterical and he uh -huh. loves to mix them. And so I'll ask yes. him a question. He'll go, oh, that train is sailed. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we have a lot of fun with language in our house. It's fun. Uh, the, uh, the word resorting has become a, um, it, it can disagree with itself. So resorting, like, you know, like settling, but if mm -hmm. you go to resort and you're just resorting as hard as you can, oh my God, that's apex. <laughs> so you have our language is so crazy. And maybe you've yeah. not even heard this newer word, but you know, you get exactly. I've not heard resorting. I, revenge yeah. travel. I've heard of revenge travel, but I have not uh, heard resorting. <laughs> revenge travel is great too. But yeah, you have these words and, and language is great. I'm like, renowned what happened to the k you know like why did yeah. it why did it get cut you know all these crazy <laughs> things do you you get wrapped up in these kind of things sometimes because my kids are really smart so they'll ask me yeah. questions uh and we have lots of interesting discussions around the dinner table about words and the english language and why certain right. things my my kids study foreign languages so they'll compare the equivalent in another language and stuff so yeah it's 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 fun to look at that and i think that's uh it's particularly as a parent and your kids play on that level and they have those questions, that's, that's, you're doing something right. I like messing with prefixes too, like the word rebuke. And I'm like, I missed my first buking. <laughs> Why did it happen? <laughs> God damn it. I'm gonna have to go back and rebuke that. God. Yeah. Uh, that's my Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get to buking first. You cannot rebuke if you have not buked first. Um, I want to, uh, I want to get into, so, you make this decision. You're like, I'm, I'm going to become an author. And look, you go in and, and you want to have these great things, but these great things have happened. You've done it, right? And so um, are you surprised at your success? And the part two is, is which book did you go, I actually can make not just a good living, but an excellent living at this. Like this actually works because you don't know right away, right? Like you've got to like, can I do it again? You don't. Um, so I had a travel show. I was the producer, the writer, and the host nationally on public television. And we claimed to public television that it was for 18 to 34 year olds, but we had people into their 60s and 70s sending fan mail in. They just loved the energy of the show, the spirit. I had created this budget travel series because the only thing on public television at that time was Rick Steves, and it was geared for a much older audience. And I wanted to go for 18 to 34 year olds because I thought travel made me a better American. Seeing my country from abroad and seeing how good I have it, uh, it just made me a better citizen, a better steward of the Republic. And I wanted to encourage young people to travel now. Don't wait until you're retired to go see Europe, see different parts of the world. Um, and I love doing that job. And I was in that job when I got married and on my honeymoon, my wife asked me, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? And for me, it was always writing a novel and getting it published. And she said, okay, when we get home, you need to start taking two hours protected time every day, no phone, no internet, no email, and start making that dream come true. And I did. And there was a lot of other things that happened on that honeymoon. I ended up meeting somebody who worked at Simon & Schuster. It was just like once that door opened, all these other doors opened. And I came home and I wrote the book. I started spending, first book, started spending two hours a day, grew to three, grew to five, and the book poured out of me. And Pete, when I finished that first book, I knew that I would never arrive at my deathbed wondering how might my life have been different if I'd only tried to write a book. And the other thing is the incredible sense, the feeling of accomplishment I had at the end. I thought to myself, this has got to be what it feels like when somebody finishes their first marathon, climbs their first mountain. It not only felt great that I did it, I knew I could do it again and again and again. And that to me was a massive feeling just of personal success. Yeah. Because I think that which we're most destined to do in life, we're often the most afraid of. We've got that little voice in the back of our head that says, you know what, don't risk the embarrassment. Don't, what, what if you write this book and it sucks, you know? Yeah. What, what, it, so we can psych ourselves out of a lot of things that are really good for us. So I really do believe that that which you're most afraid of is probably the thing you're most destined to do in life. One of the things. Um, as far as when the success, it, it felt successful, you know, it felt great when I hit the New York Times list, you know, a few books in. So I made that list. That was a huge deal. Uh, getting my first number one was a massive deal. There's writers that I know that have written their whole lives and have never gotten to that position. There's a lot that goes into it beyond just the writing of the book. It's who are you competing with? Wow. Uh, a couple of years ago, James Patterson did a book with Bill Clinton 
and uh, it landed the same week my book came out, same day. And they got number one, I got number two. And somebody in my office said, don't you dare mope and feel bad about that number two, because if I could go back to you, a younger you in college and say, you know, X amount of years from now, you're going to be competing with James Patterson and a former United States president for the number one slot on the New York Times. You might not get it. You might get number two. And I would have gone, oh, my God, I'm going to actually write books. I can, I'm going to see it through and I'll take that number two. So, uh, so for me, Pete, the feeling of success really came with completing that first book. And I'm just kind of this head down, nose to the grindstone, work, 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 Midwestern guy, son of a Marine and a flight attendant. I, I, I don't look back. I always look forward. And so it's like if I stop and look over my shoulder at like my career, the books yeah. lined up, it's it's wild. Sometimes I can't even I can't even believe it myself because I, I don't and I probably should take the time to breathe in and appreciate that. But I'm always about what's the next book and how do I better myself? That's why this is so hard and why it doesn't get easier is because I raise the bar personally and professionally with each novel because I want to go someplace I haven't been before. I want to show readers uh, thrills and chills. I don't want to repeat anything. I want them. And the fact that I've done 21 books in this series and I still am growing my audience tells me I'm doing something right for my employers, those readers. Yeah. Yeah, you do. You I always wonder, like when Sue Grafton got to O is for you know you're like <laughs> she's like God, I'm stuck with this for the rest of my life. I gotta get through the end of the alphabet. Yep. Can I please do something else? No. Yeah. Matter of fact, what are you gonna do after Z? You know, like oh, A A is for the row that I'm sitting in at the game. You know, whatever. Um, did your dad meet your uh, mom at a bar? Because that's where flight attendants and and service members often meet. You know what? They, the two of them did meet, but my godfather was a bartender and bar manager. So uh, at a really neat kind of clubby type place, 1960s in Chicago that had jazz music and stuff like this. So if I remember the story correctly, he had introduced them uh, right. at this bar. So yeah, they did. They did meet at a bar. Right. It, uh, it, Classy it, bar though. Classy yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Some dispersion. gin joint, Pete. This is my mother we're talking about here. <laughs> my mom, leave my mom out of this. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a good callback though, because because life does happen out where life is, and I love that that you get the same thing I get. Like so, um, and I guess that should just my pitch in right now for everybody to hear. Hey, Save the Brave is going to ride across the country from Temecula to uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and along the way, we're going to meet up with people. And if you want to meet up with us, you can meet us well anywhere along the way. But but Tucson, El Paso. Odessa, if you're crazy, Dallas, Houston, New Orleans, Birmingham, Atlanta, and Charleston. Join us anywhere along the route. If you want to help, go to savethebrave.org or just email me and say, hey, Pete, what can I do? I'm trying to get my gas covered from within my network because I'm driving the truck. Scott's driving the motorcycle. And that's one of the things you guys can help us do. I'm dedicating this year's ride to my brother who passed away in October, veteran suicide. We're trying to get on top of this problem. We're trying to help the families that deal with the aftermath. And so that's one of the ways you can get involved. So that's that's just for everybody in the audience. What I want to say to you, Brad, though, is when you get on the road and you go see how beautiful your country is and then you meet these people for whatever reason you meet them, whether you're doing a charity ride or you're just traveling and you allow them to yourself to meet them where they are. And look, I'm really critical. Maybe maybe you're in this boat. And so if you are, I apologize. But I'm really critical of like the, the standard New York. Like I was in Arkansas and they actually and then they're so amazed that someone else can live like they live. And it's very condescending. I try to approach people. Look, if you live in Terlingua, Texas, I'm fascinated to know what it's like because it's such a place. It's a place you live in because you don't want to live around a bunch of people. You don't mm -hmm. mind that it's hot because it's your own beautiful little place. But when you see America and you realize, oh, my God, this is not the place I see in the news. What? Uh, I'm sorry. Was there? There's I, no I thought you were going to go I didn't know if there was a question there. Or well, there's, there's just a, well, I think it's just, a, um, you know, like, do you relate to that? I mean, as a guy that's traveled, you've met a lot of people and you can meet bartenders and you can meet people that have dreams that haven't realized them. You can meet people that are down. On the, you meet all these people yeah. and they're not the people that are represented in, in the news. They're, they're real life people that have beautiful lives. Yeah, that have beautiful lives. And I'll tell you, probably one of the most poignant revelations that I've had as an adult is that we all, everybody you meet has something going on and you might not be able to see it. We all have our own cross to bear. 
and uh, sometimes it's visible. It's a disability. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you, you've you lost somebody very close to you to, to suicide, which is absolutely tragic. Uh, that it is. Uh, I'm always blown away by the spirit of this country, no matter where I go and how much we have in common. It's one of the things that I hate so much about the culture war and all the tribalism junk right now is that there's so much more that unites us as Americans than divides us. Yet we're we're being pushed against each other. And I mean, that's how you drive people out to elections is get them pissed off. That's how you get people to keep tuning in to your nightly news program is give them stuff to be scared about or angry about. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a shame that so many people fall into that trap. But yeah. No matter where I go, uh, and book tour is really the neat, neat thing because invariably I get to a town early and there's always somebody who's going to take, drive me around and get me to the events and get me to the bookstores and stuff like that. And they're like, okay, well, where do you want to go to eat? And I'm like, take me to where you go to eat. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, oh, we don't go to the same places. I'm like, you like barbecue? Yes, I do. love barbecue. You know, so it is, it is a neat thing to do to be able to travel and to travel within your own country and see different ways of doing things is is incredible yeah. because it isn't new york is just one little slice of the country so is seattle so is odessa yeah i mean it is a it is an amazing country filled with amazing amazing people and uh you, listen I, I think it's great to travel internationally but you could travel your entire life in the united states and have incredible experiences wherever you go i know uh I've heard a lot of stories about people traveling, particularly in the early pandemic, and how much good stuff they saw, how kind people were, and how people helped out other people, even in those beginning lockdown things. Uh, my, uh, I'm constantly getting good stories. My nephew is a truck driver. Uh, he's a really sweet guy, um, and he was doing uh, pizza delivery. And then, you know, the need for truck drivers soared and he went to he went to school for it and everything. And now he's on the road and he's just got great stories of how kind people are to him and all these little spots he he gets to across the country. Yeah. If anyone comes to my hometown, even though I don't live there anymore, I'm so proud of it. I'm like, oh, let me let me show you a couple of cool things. We have a gravity hill in my town. We have all these great tales. And so. I just like give like the hour long tour to someone who's, you know, if I bring them to town, I, and my, and my town is gorgeous. It's, it's surrounded on three sides by water. And, like, and, and I love it down where I live in Southern California. It's also incredible. And so I do the same things, but there are people out there that just want to show you the best of, of their world, whether it's Odessa or Atlanta or Benicia in my case, by the way, thanks candy for the, uh, for the drop. I'll put that money to work on the ride. Um, what are your favorite parts of the country? It could be people. It could be places. Where do you love to go back over and over again? Well, I, so I've lived in a couple of different places. So I grew up in Chicago. Uh, my wife and I got married and she had a job uh, working with the U.S. ski team. So we moved to Utah, which was absolutely fantastic. So we lived in Park City, spent a lot of time in Salt Lake City. Utah was a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, my children's godfather, uh, I met him in Utah. And he was a former fifth group guy, just a terrific, terrific guy. And he was just such an outdoorsman, fly fishing and all this kind of stuff. So I got to do so many things, you know, climbing and hiking. And uh, so I, I love Utah in the Mountain West. It's absolutely beautiful. I live in Nashville now, uh, which is gorgeous. And there's so much uh, to do here in the state of Tennessee. Uh, I grew up going a lot. Florida was the big deal for my family. That's where we would vacation when we did do vacations. And so I enjoy taking my kids down to Florida. Uh, I've made a promise I won't do it after May anymore. I used to take them in June when they got out of school and it was just miserable. And I did it two years, of, two summers in a row. And they said, have you finally learned your lesson? You know, and I'm like, yeah. And they said, OK, we'll let you back in the house now. You know, and so they opened up the door and I got to come in from the heat and the humidity. Um, yeah. But I, I love Arizona, so I love a lot of the warm places. And I went to school in Southern California, so I had uh, my cousins all lived on Coronado, which was really cool, and obviously home to the SEAL community and everything. So uh, that, those are some of the places that I really enjoy. And we had a little place in Wisconsin on a beautiful lake called Lake Geneva. And I missed that a lot because my dad had a boat, and we could go out boating, and there was just something about – being out on the water that uh, we do have that here in, in Nashville, there's plenty of water here, but it's not the same for me is, is I guess you always want to go home. You want to go to where you were as a kid. So uh, Wisconsin's another favorite slice of the country for me. 
Lake Geneva is really idyllic. You can, well, I know they have shot movies there. It's just one of those really magical places. It's, it's not too big and yeah, it's, it's great. I love it there. Yeah. It's a nice place. You, um, you've run for president. Do you going to do this again? According to my wife? No, never again. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, when I announced that I wanted to do that, I was hoping that I'd be able to create enough momentum, uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to turn off any of your audience with any partisan stuff. I'm the son of a United States Marine. Character is very important to me, and uh, what I was seeing, uh, I can understand people's desire for a disruptor and all this kind of stuff. But I was not seeing uh, in Donald Trump character that I approved of. Uh, sure. Nor that's not how I was raised. You don't. I'm not going to go into my list of stuff. Um, but it's I I have. I've it's no, it's, no, I'm not running again. I'll just leave it at that before I okay. get myself into trouble. Yeah. Well, if you do run again, no one's going to hold it against you that you said that on the break it down show because politicians <laughs> change their mind. I mean, Johnson changed his mind. Hillary Clinton changed her mind. You know, yeah. it happens all the time. Um, but I do want to get into this, this topic a little bit, because again, because we're basically the same age. And I often think, you know, if I, and I often said like, if Pete was president and because I've got an international background, because I've seen a lot of the nation, I, I feel like, um, you know, I, I could do the job. I don't want that crap job because everybody would hate mm. me and it would be horrible and I wouldn't want to put myself or my loved ones through it. But, you know, when I look at the things that I'd want to see, like I, like my commitment would be, if Pete was president, I'd work 12 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week. I might take a half day off every now and then just yeah. rest, rest and everything. But that's what you would get from me. And then I would, and maybe this is crazy, Brad, but I would invite people, Americans from districts all around the nation to, to come and ride along with me two or three a day all the time. And I would focus on unity. I would just focus on, like, I would have congressional members over to the, uh, the house every day from different sides. And we'd sit down and just be people together because the president in my, in my mind, isn't the King. And so I'd start, I I'd start like going, handing executive orders over to the Congress and saying, you better pass something. Cause I'm going to turn this off in two weeks. And let's do that every two weeks while I was president. And if my rating got below 30%, I would just walk out and be like, hey, you guys don't like what I'm doing. Let the next guy take over. But um, but we'll never see that. We'll never see someone that runs on character and like, here's what I'll do. And I, I can't I can't deliver you anything. I don't have anything. What I have is tenacity, hard work, and mm -hmm. these kinds of things. We seem to be in a run of presidents that are less than average. And that's across the board. I mean, when you look at like, it's almost like a antebellum president run that we've had here where we're just picking the worst possible people to, to do this job. And we just seem to love it. And then we, and then we get upset when it doesn't work out. You know, so we speak of character here. I love teasing. So I grew up in Chicago. And so I have a lot of friends who are Democrats and uh, from high school and just growing up there and everything. And I love to tease them. Oh boy. Remember when Mitt Romney was the meanest, most horrible potential candidate you ever saw? Ooh, right. that Mitt Romney boy, was he a <laughs> bad man. Yeah. And it's like, you know, so if you can vilify Mitt Romney, who's one of the most decent, intelligent uh, I, there's a guy who never needed to serve. He wasn't doing it for his ego. I mean, this right. is a this is a guy who truly believed in a in service. He had America had been very good to him. He had uh, been able to succeed based on the opportunities that were afforded to him here. Uh, and I, I just laugh. I laugh. I'm like, be careful what you wish for. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have so many, like I said, so many more things that unite us than divide us. And there's so many issues where they're like 80 20 issues where if you can, you can nail the landing on an 80 percent or, you know, you're doing pretty well. You're going to have 80 percent of the people backing you on that. Uh, listen, I, I, in, in the core of who I am, I believe that we don't own this country. We're merely stewards of this republic. And it's incumbent yeah. upon you and me and all of the other adults to leave a stronger, freer, more prosperous, more secure nation than was left to us. Uh, I see the national debt in the deficit as a national security issue. That's a big, big problem. Yeah. Uh, I think it, 
we we do not have long term vision. I think we forget things very quickly and we're very soft. I think we're going to forget a lot of the lessons of COVID, particularly supply chain issues and how much stuff we offshore, how much of our drugs come from China. Uh, the whole chip thing is absolutely insane that we're not building our own chips here, that we have to get them from South Korea and Taiwan and uh, China cornering the market on rare earth minerals. There's just there's a lot of stuff for national security, energy independence. There's there's a lot that if I was able, if Brad was present, there's there's yeah. certain things that I would really like to like to do. Uh, you know, and listen, I've always been I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. I've always been a gun guy. I, I will say and I mean, big time, big time gun guy. I don't like the fetishization of weapons. I don't like people showing up at capitals with their long guns. They look like a bunch of jackasses. That is not responsible firearms ownership. That to me is akin to brandishing and trying to intimidate maybe people that you don't agree with, whether it's politicians or whatever. And I understand that a, a government that fe when the people fear the government, I think it was Jefferson that said, uh, when people fear the government, there's tyranny. And when the government fears the people, there's liberty. I, I just, I don't like a lot of the fetishization stuff. Uh, and I was always die hard, die hard, die hard, die hard on, uh, you know, mind your own business, don't tell me and all that kind of stuff. But when, you have a, when you're a member of society, when you're a steward of the Republic, you have to be engaged on issues. And I, my kids have done so many damn lockdown drills and they're so frightened by these things. And, yeah. and it's really in the back of their minds, my teen kids. So I had no problem with making, raising the age on buying a long gun to 25. Fuck you, I don't care. I don't yeah. care. You can't get it. Or maybe 21. I could talk about 21, 25. But I mean, the, the frontal lobe is not fully formed till 26. But if we look and we break down the age group of a lot of these mass shooters, uh, the guy in Buffalo was like 18, the guy down in Texas. So there's a lot to be said for not. It, it, we're a nation of a lot of guns. And if somebody's determined, I'm not saying that they're not going to be able to find guns. And, and so, yeah, you can get a lot of stuff on the black market. But I'm a, I, I, I think that's a worthwhile thing to look at. And if people on the right dig in their heels and there's never any compromise, well, you know, I didn't like that they passed Obamacare with not a single Republican vote, that it was voted straight down the middle. I think we need to relearn the ability to come together as fellow citizens fellow countrymen and women in deal with issues. I don't think school shootings are the price we should be willing to pay for living in a free society. I think we should be doing everything we can uh, short of banning guns and, and way short of that, way short of that. Yeah. I, I think a reasonable thing is to raise the age so an 18 year old uh, can't, can't get his hands on, uh, on weapons. I think if you can't drink to your 21, maybe you, you shouldn't be able to get a, you know, a long gun. I, I, it's, it's fraught with a lot of peril. I'm sure you're going to hear people that disagree with me and that's okay. Yeah. That's yeah. it's, it's, this is America. You, we are free to disagree. I just think we need to be freer with talking with each other and trying to find solutions, whether it's like the national yeah. debt, whether, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. There is, there are so many problems to tackle and most of them yeah. are not tackleable, you know? So yeah. let's just say that we do the 25 year old thing next school shooting where it'll be, well, now it's, you know, and, and, cause there's not, there's not a single soul. Like maybe we can me ameliorate, but it's a cultural problem, right? We have this, this thing where we're not able Young to men adrift and lack of community where these kids are not the lack of, you know, we used to say, and Pete, you'll remember this is mm -hmm. what do the neighbors think? Now we don't right. even know our neighbors' names. And yeah. so you get people who are not plugged into a community. So we're not seeing when they're faltering, when they're slipping, right. when they're having mental health issues. Uh, you know, or, or when we do identify it, but we're incapable of, of having a system capture right. the person and, and start to case manage their problems. We, yeah. we, I mean, a friend of mine had a daughter die at Parkland and, and, you know, the, the common theme, yes, there were guns used, but also there was mental problems that were yeah. identified early, but we couldn't get on top. And I don't know what the heck you do about that. You know, it's, it's uh, one of the yeah. things like if you, if you were too insane to own a gun, well, then you should be too insane to vote if you can't manage the two things. Right. But that right. causes people like trouble. And I want to add this in, too, because I'm interested in what you have to say. We have the capability of reducing the threat in schools. One, we have to understand this is one of those problems that it's so statistically out on the edge of the bell curve. It's really hard to get a reliable and repeated solution. So you could hire someone who's look, RSOs have become something other than what they were intended to be right now. There are these this resource 
You should have officer De- officers. Yeah. yeah, we should have officer deadly there. Someone who you never want to mess with contract that in and um, allow the federal government some intrusion into our privacy so we can early identify these people and target them and, and try to find a, care, a way to care for them. You know, we have tools for these things. We just don't like the solution. Yeah, it's it's hard because there's not going to be a one size fits all that works, right? So right, right. In, <laughs> and oftentimes you get parents that want to have a school resource officer there who knows what he's doing and you get pushback from, uh, from the teachers and things like that in some cases, not all. Uh, but you can't put this guy in there with soft armor where kids are using you know long guns to, yeah. to shoot. You've got to let this guy have plates and is he going to walk around with the plates all day or is he going to have plates satched in different places? I mean, it's, it, it's not easy. And a pistol is not the right weapon in most cases in these things. You need something. You need your own reach out and touch someone capacity. I mean, that's just the reality. Uh, yeah, a- ab- absolutely. With the right optics and all that kind of stuff. And then you right. need a, a, you, you Listen, any, any person who's willing to walk in to fire towards gunfire is an amazingly brave human being. Now right. you put kids between you and the threat. Then that just takes it up another level. I mean, that's a kind of uh, incredible human being. I don't even know how I would function in that situation. You could tell yourself you train, 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 train. But then if you've got to take a shot and yeah. if you, you're off by a little bit, you're you're taking out a seven-year-old. I mean, but this guy's got to stop. It's, it's, it, you know what, Pete, it's tough. And we're not going to find perfect solutions. You know, you and I talked about, should the age be 21? Should it be 25? Yeah. Uh, you know, and then you've got that that monster that shot up Sandy Hook. He killed his mom and stole her guns. Yeah. So it wouldn't have mattered what the age was, yeah. right? You know, Timothy McVeigh, uh, no guns. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Timothy McVeigh, it was all, it was, what was it? Uh, diesel and fertilizer and yeah. yeah. Rocks. Well, and the, the, the worst school massacre in, in history happened in the 1920s in Bath, Michigan. And that was explosives. Right. So, uh, you know, and the, the Brits have their own knife problem uh, and, and have had these things. And you see what's going on in New York with knives and pushing people in the subways. Yeah. There's always going to be mental illness. There's always going to be evil. It, there isn't a one size fits all. But if yeah. we can start looking at how do we get people with mental issues to help, that's a big deal. And what can we learn from all the tragedy so far? Is it is it predominantly young men, 18 years old? Do they is this? You know, and I don't know if the guy in Texas, had he gone to that school? Had he been a student there? Was there some sort of a connection? Because I know I've been reading about some of the uh, right. m- multiple shooters have connections with the school. So maybe we should push the age back so that they're they're getting distance away from the school before they can buy a firearm and return to settle grudges or, you know, suicide by cop, if that's what the situation is. For yeah. them. But again, there's no there's no perfect thing. And I'm, a, you know, I. Again, life member of the NRA. I don't want anybody yeah. coming for my guns or touching my guns. I'm a responsible yeah. firearms owner, but I'm also a responsible citizen where if there's some, you know, tiny tweaks with a screwdriver to the overall machine that can help uh, reduce this stuff. I don't think we'll ever make gun violence go away. There's always going to be a bat, crazy guy like the, the guy dressed like the Joker that walked into the movie theater in Aurora, um, you know, it's Aurora, Colorado, and started yeah. shooting it up. Um you know, that it, it's just it, it, it breaks my heart when I see these families lose, particularly children. I, I just it's one thing yeah. that I don't know. I, I don't know how as a parent you ever get over that. I don't know. I, I can't imagine that you ever do. I mean, there's always mm-hmm. it's just out of your hands. It wasn't supposed to happen. Your kid's supposed to be safe at school. Right. We hope we all yeah. agree. On that. And just to, to put a note on that and then we'll move on to something else. But if you think teachers or even resource officers ask him how ask a resource officer how many rounds they put down range in a year i promise you it's not 500 it's just not and so you have people that have no business being in that environment if you want to believe how hard like it is to develop capacity go out shooting with your friends and when you're shooting at paper targets i'm not talking about i'm talking to the audience walk in place and let me know how you do shooting it's extremely hard and try now try to do that at 45 meters or whatever it is you need to take that shot with that pistol. It's just, it's not, it's not as easy as we think it is. So we've got to find a comprehensive approach to it, you know? Uh, that's why the things about shoot them in the legs. You well, can't do that. It, it, it's, it's nuts. And anybody who's had yeah. any self-defense training yeah. with firearms knows uh, there's no shoot to kill. You shoot to stop. Why yeah. did you shoot the guy five times or why yeah. shoot the guy six? Cause five wasn't enough. The guy right. didn't stop coming at me until that sixth round, you know, hit yeah, him. It's, it's, I'm using lethal force. They have escalated. There's no, 
like once you grab that pistol and you pull it out, you know, because you're an NRA guy, like you, this thing is intended to end this threat, whether it's a threat towards right. me or it's I'm projecting it to threat. Threat. Yeah. somebody else. Yeah. It's not, um, oh, I'll shoot this person in the arm and get them down. That that's, 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 that's nuts. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, that's enough about President Brad, unless you have anything else you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I appreciate you having this conversation with me because we, again, we've grown up at the exact same time. We can see how far we've come. I mean, uh, look at like uh, how far we've advanced as a nation in terms of rights for homosexuals. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible in our lifetime. They used to be yeah. jokes. You heard them all the time. And now yeah. it's, it's like, man, it, it's uncomfortable to hear things from our lifetime. Like, we're going to reach that point where we're dated, you know, and we're like, Oh yeah. boy, you know, <laughs> and look at 52, we legitimately may, or are you, are you 52 still? Um, yeah. We may only be halfway done, you know, because people are living to be a hundred all the yeah. time now. And, and so these things are going to happen. How do you keep up when writing and with society in general and your kids and everything, how do you keep up with all these things? Like I just can't be bothered with TikTok. But, you know, ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm hip to a lot of things. How do you do it? Well, so first of all, having kids is great, right? So I've got built-in uh, tech support uh, on, on anything I need in the house or in my office. Uh, yeah, there's some stuff that is just a giant sinkhole of time. And I think that is probably why you fall away from some of the pop culture stuff as you get older, because your focus is where your focus should be. You're, you, you've got your career, you've got your family, uh, hopefully you're concerned and involved in your community uh, because that's the way the nation was founded, right? It's everything was as much as possible was supposed to happen as close as possible to you. Not everything was supposed to be in DC. So the decisions that weren't enumerated were, were left to the states themselves, the states being laboratories of democracy. Uh, and I always joke that if the states are laboratories of democracy, Illinois is a, is a, is a meth lab, which is why <laughs> I left Illinois and moved to, uh, to Nashville with no state income taxes and uh, a lot better, I think, uh, policies that uh, deal with crime and things like that. I live in a nice, safe area. Uh, we have our problems down here, but it's, I'm, I, I'm so glad every day that I don't live downtown Chicago like I did. Um, but as far as staying up on stuff, uh, I, the mind, Pete, is like a parachute, right? It's got to be open to work. So I, I try to keep my mind open and not prejudge things. Uh, I keep I keep plugged in. I, you know, I'm, I'm not doing TikTok, uh, and I don't let my kids do it because it's Chinese, and I don't like that. I, I, gotta, I get a real thing about TikTok. Uh, it's very funny. In the new book, uh, and I'm not trying to pivot back to the book, but I, I no, but you, gotta, can. I, you have a book you're selling. It's called rising tiger. Everybody should get two copies. Oh, you're a good man. Thank you. Uh, so, but in rising tiger, it's interesting. Uh, two years ago, this summer, the Chinese crept across the border in the Himalayas into India, and they had a gentleman's agreement that no firearms could come into this area, but that was it. And so the Chinese came in with all of these homemade weapons, iron bars studded with spikes, baseball bats wrapped with barbed wire, and they attacked a group of Indian troops. Um, and it was this six hour long, bloody, horrible melee, like medieval style combat. Yeah. And one of the things that the Indians did uh, as, uh, as punishment to the Chinese is there's over a billion, you know, it's like 1.3, over a billion Indians, and they all have cell phones. They pulled all the Chinese apps out of the Indian app store. And it was devastating for the Chinese tech sector because they made so much money from that. And the, the Indians said, listen, you're using these apps to spy on our, our citizens. You're collecting biometric data with these. And you know what? Too bad for you. You guys suck. You came into our sovereign territory. You attacked our troops. So I'm not a fan of really Chinese anything. Uh, if it's got a direct link back to the Chinese Communist Party. I think that's a that's a bad area. I, I think as Americans, that's another thing as President Brad, we'd be paying a lot yes. more attention to the Uyghurs. Uh, I think, and particularly the North Korean uh, labor camps, uh, there, there used to be a lot of talk in World War II, particularly in the aftermath of World War II, that we knew where the train lines were that were going to the concentration camps and we didn't bomb the mm -hmm. crap out of those. Uh, and, and we should. So anyway, TikTok's not for me, but I'm, yeah. I'm all across social media and I listen to my kids. My kids will tell me what they like. So my daughter's a big K-pop person. She likes BTS and all this kind of stuff. So one of my big things that I try to stay up to date with is music uh, yeah. because I, I think music is something you could share 
with anybody. Like I'll pull up next to somebody, like there'll be teens in the other car and they'll hear what I'm listening to and I'll get the thumbs up or whatever. And I don't do it to be cool. I love music. I love all sorts of music. So I don't blare the Sinatra when I'm out of the house. That's when I crack the bottle of red wine and I'm cooking pasta for the family. I'll have the, the Dean Martin or the Sinatra going. But when I'm out yeah. on the streets in my whip with the top down, you know, you could be getting some <laughs> Lizzo yeah. or you could be getting some uh, Dua Lipa. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot of potential stuff I could be listening to out on the street. Okay, I got to hip you to Sage Logan. She's uh, up and coming and, and and a hell of a person. So I'll shoot that over to you. You guys should okay. all check out Sage Logan on Spotify as well. Um, and then one of the things, but people from our era, you know, we grew up in the 80s, the charts in the, in the top 10, it's like Prince, the Eagles, you know, like yeah. it, anything. It could be anything. And we had a very diversified look at this. And so if anything, Gen X, we... Um, we don't mind, uh, you know, checking it out and seeing what happens mm. and and uh, giving things a chance. And so let's all just try to take that Gen X attitude, everybody. Hey, if you're going to buy the book, Rising Tiger, buy two copies. I'm serious about this. And send one to a friend. They're going to love it. Look, Brad's a pro. You can see what he's been doing this 21 books for the series now. Trust me, Brad knows what he's doing. So buy one. If you want to do a buddy read with me, let's do it. You buy the book. I'll read with you and then we'll discuss it and we'll have a great time. Brad, I, I want to, I don't want to take any more of your time. You've been awesome. Thank you so much for talking about president Brad. That was fun for me. Um, <laughs> anything in closing at all, my friend? Well, uh, you know, I'll tell you the, the uh, we've got a lot we're going to face as a nation going forward. We've got midterms, we've got general election. They're talking about the potential. Like, gosh, I hope not knock on wood of a recession next year. Leave room for grace. That's the big watchword I developed with my kids at the beginning of the pandemic. And I, I, you know, things aren't over for us as a nation yet, but we are strong. We're resilient. We can tackle anything that comes at us. And if anything, stay positive. America's best days are ahead of her. They're not behind us. They are ahead of us. So stay positive, stay pro-America and take care of your friends, your coworkers, and your neighbors. Don't forget your neighbors. There's a lot of people hurting out there that just reaching out to them would make a big, huge difference. I love it. I love it. All right, stand by. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here, are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you 